Welcome, everyone. We are at a Word Vancouver panel on nonfiction titled, What Are Children's Magazines Looking For? I'm your host today, Christine Changardecki. And here we have three guests with us, or two of them live here and one of them from Toronto. So it's always a good sign when an event starts with a question um, because that means we're gonna get some answers. And we've got a great panel ahead of us today exploring the world of children's magazines, which is certainly an intersecting space of fiction and nonfiction writing. So we've got um, editors joining us today, discussing how a magazine is made, and we will find differences from and similarities to what each of them are looking for when they're creating an issue. Just a reminder to everybody that all the books featured throughout this festival can be purchased through Iron Dog Books. You can visit them in the tech gallery by the big window in the lobby. Given the nature of our event and the guests, we are actually the ones who have issues of magazines to give out. So thank you to Chirp, Chickadee and Owl Magazines, Bazoof Magazine, and the Nature Kids team for providing these for our audience. Of course, at the end of the session, if you're interested in subscribing to these magazines, you can do so on each of these individual websites. Welcome. If you're looking for other ways to support the festival, you can head online and participate in our silent auction at wordvancouver.ca. Bidding is open until September 26th, and proceeds help to support keeping this festival free and accessible. I would like to take time right now to acknowledge that this festival takes place on the unceded homelands of the Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh people. We have also we also have guests joining us from across Turtle Island, and I recognize that our shared participation in this event is only possible through the First Nations of many territories of this land. The second National Day of Truth and Reconciliation is upon us. As we take time to reflect on the truths of the hidden and silent stories of residential school survivors and the legacy of harm towards Indigenous peoples, I hope we also spend time celebrating the joy, beauty, and excellence of the First Peoples of this land. This festival is a celebration of storytelling. We are now finally getting the opportunity to hear more diverse voices in literature and publishing, and that in, in itself is such a joy. But we all have a responsibility to continue furthering the demand for more representation in the world of publishing, and I hope all of us in this room today and at home can commit to at least one formal request for stories from different Indigenous nations so we can learn from, support, and uplift these communities. Word Vancouver would like to take a moment to thank our generous donors and sponsors. The Canada Arts Council, the Canada Book Fund, the Canada Heritage Fund, Canada Periodical Fund, the BC Arts Council, BC Gaming, Creative BC, the City of Vancouver, the DVBIA, the Yosef Wask Family Foundation, the Hamber Foundation, the BC and Yukon Book Prizes, the Asian Canadian Writers Workshop, Quill BC, Pace and Associates, the Crime Writers Association, the Federation of BC Writers, the Surrey Library, the Vancouver Public Library, the League of Canadian Poets, the Writers Union of Canada, and many more. For a full list of our partners, please visit our website. Without you, this free festival could not happen. If you haven't already, please consider making a donation via our website, www.wordvancouver.ca. And now on to our guests. Today we have three guests representing the wonderful world of children's magazines. And as they tackle the question of not only what their publications are looking for, but what their readers are like in this day and age. I'm curious about the digital and print platforms they exist in, and we're sure to gain insights on what is sure to be a rapidly changing industry. First, joining us from Toronto through Zoom, we have Jackie Farquhar. Jackie is the editor-in-chief of award-winning magazines Chirp, Chickadee, and Owl magazines. She's also edited four nonfiction books for children and can often be seen hosting craft and science segments on TV and at live events. Welcome, Jackie. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. It's strange that I can't see the audience, but <laughs> I trust that you are there. <laughs> um, like Christine said, I am the editor in chief of Chirp Chickadee and Owl magazines. I also apologize because I sent some copies of the issues, but unfortunately the post failed me and they are not there. But if anyone wants a issue after, you can email me and I will personally send you a copy. Um, but to give you a little background on our magazines, I do have a short presentation, um, which might be especially helpful since you can't see the magazines in their physical form. So I'm just going to share my screen and hope that this works. So 
sorry, bear with me. Okay, can everybody see that, hopefully? Yeah, it looks good, Jackie. Okay, good. Um, again, it's just a short presentation about our three magazines. So we've actually been around for over 40 years. Owl Magazine was started in 1975. Chickadee was started in 1975 and Chirp in 1997. So we've been at it a long time and obviously we've had many changes throughout the years, but our main mandate has remained the same. And that is that we hope to foster literacy as well as the emotional growth of children and to really open up the world of themselves and the world around them and encourage discovery and creativity along the way. We take a lot of joy in opening kids' minds um, at developmentally appropriate levels that hopefully are fun for them. They understand the information we present and also um, really engage and have a good time learning. And of course, another important thing with us is that we really want every child who picks up a copy of the magazine to see themselves in the issue. So we try to present a real variety of content that we hope inspires every single child who picks up the magazines. These are um, our three magazines. So Chirp is for kids aged three to six. It's sort of our you know preschool, early literacy, Magazine Chickadee is the next one up for kids six to nine years old, and Owl is for kids nine to 13. Of course, these are all just really general uh, age ranges. We have lots of eight year olds who read Chirp, we have lots of six year olds who read Owl. So it really depends on the child. And we also have a lot of adults that read the magazines as well. We have educators, caregivers, we have um, ESL students, we have many different. Um, people reading it. And of course, it is a general interest magazine. All three of them are general interest. It started out as a real science and nature magazine. And that has remained, although we are always evolving based on education and cultural trends. So we cover sort of everything. Some of the issues are themed, especially Chirp is actually always, always themed. And, um, you know, with things that are like popular with kids that age. So we'll have a buildings issue, a pretend issue, things like that. They, all the magazines, we do 10 issues a year and they're based on a subscription model where we have international subscribers, but the bulk of our readers are in Canada. We have about five to 10% in the US and then a few percent spread all over the world. We have readers in Australia, we have readers in Asia, we have readers everywhere. Um, so that's something that we always keep in mind when we're planning issues too, that we're not just talking to kids in a certain geographical location. So we want it to resonate with everybody. And as I'm sure with many print um, magazines, we are no longer just print. We do digital issues of each um, issue each month. We also have an additional monthly e-mag uh, for OWL that has completely different content than the print version. And we also have a daily news website called owlconnected.com where it's for older readers and it's really to break down and distill world issues, social justice issues, um, highlight kids who are doing amazing things, science breakthroughs, all kinds of stuff for the nine to 13 year old crowd. A lot of teachers love that too. We also do a lot of special issues throughout the year, uh, digital and print issues. And we have blogs. Chirp has a TV show on Kids CBC. Chirp, the character is also part of apps. And we have a YouTube channel that has a lot of interactive content, crafts, recipes, experiments, and things like that. And as mentioned, I'm often doing uh, TV appearances, doing crafts with kids. And we do have a lot of events that we work at with partners, um, such as Toys R Us and and things like that. So we're we're out there in the world in many different ways beyond print. These are just some of the um, special issues that we've done recently. We've been doing some uh, Indigenous-led special issues. Um, we've done two so far on Ojibwe of Great Spirit Island, also known as Manitoulin. We've done one on Haida 
uh, Haida Gwaii, and we are now working on one um, that focuses on the East Coast, uh, the Mi'kmaq. So we're excited about those. And we've also done a, a few different special issues, as you can see here, that we do school guides, puzzle, puzzle books, um, social emotional learning books, steam books, all sorts of good stuff. <laughs> And, oh, this looks very small, but <laughs> we do publish fiction and nonfiction features in every issue, comics, puzzles, lots of interactive content, as mentioned, science experiments and things like that. The overall themes are always environment, environmental stewardship, science and tech uh, breakthroughs, personal development and growth for kids of all ages, animals, conservate, like animal conservation, history, geography, culture, social justice, and pop culture, of course. And this is just some examples of uh, things that we've done recently. One thing that we love is doing personal profile stories. So this was a page from Chirp, and this was actually a Chirp reader. Her name is Fiona, and she is five now, and her family runs a strawberry farm in Ontario. So they reached out to us and shared their story with us and we decided to profile them in the magazine. And we do that a lot if readers, especially if readers reach out or people like veterinarians reach out or who do amazing things. We really love to feature readers and, and show them talking in their own voice. And then this is another example of um, what we do in CHIRP, which would be considered our fiction section. And we do longer narrative stories like this one. We also do poetry and um and comics all kinds of different things and then these are some examples from chickadee so this is our main feature which was uh talking about electricity how electricity gets to your home and then we have some other stories for the chickadee age group of six to nine and in owl we tend to go a little bit more serious we still do have puzzles and comics and lots of fun content but we really lean heavily on um, animal conservation on um, opening up readers to different cultures, to different histories, maybe histories that haven't been told previously, um, and and sort of you know more more serious things like that, but hopefully still fun and engaging. But as you can see, it's a lot more almost like a adult magazine. And our process is probably I'm interested to hear the other presenters to see if our process is the same. We work really far in advance, six months in advance. We're always working on about three to four issues at a time. So right now, even though it is September, we are planning our March and April and May 2023 issues. So we work really far in advance because we actually consult with a lot of um readers, caregivers, educators. We have different advisory committees for each magazine. We have um, other people on the, on the board, scientists and uh, teachers, all sorts of people who we get feedback from very regularly. So they really drive our um, decisions in terms of what we what content we put in the magazines. So they're constantly giving us feedback. And so we're deciding really far in advance what we're going to do. And then obviously then we research, research, research. And then we are a small team. A lot of writing is actually done by our staff, but we do also assign bigger stories to freelancers. So we do that along the way as well. And then um, we of course edit, we fact check everything we proofread everything. And then once we go through that process of making the magazine, we gather more feedback from more outside consultants. And so that would be our board members, that would be educational consultants, teachers, it would also be kids that we get feedback from. And then sometimes we have to go back to the drawing board and, and start over on some uh, things. So that's why we do also work so far in advance so that we're giving ourselves opportunity to change things if we need to. Um, also, we assign all of the art is fresh and new every issue. So we assign that to illustrators as we go as well. We have a lot of regular contributors, a lot of regular writers and, and artists, but we do like to vary them per issue. 
so that it's always feeling fresh. And also we love showcasing talent, many different types of talent. So we try not to get too stuck on using the same people all the time. And of course, we collaborate along the way with all of our freelancers. And that has become a real part of our process now that we are really working in collaboration with all of our contributors throughout the way. We are not always just assigning a story like we would want, we want to do a story on this, go write it. We're really taking feedback um, all along the way and getting our contributors to sort of come in to the team with us and work on it with us. Um, so we do hire a variety of freelancers, um, mostly for our features, for Owl and for Chickadee and for our stories in Chirp and Chickadee. And what we're always looking for, people pitch to us as well as we reach out to people. And we're always trying to um, make new contacts in different communities. But what we're always looking for when being pitched to is newsworthy topics, especially science and tech breakthroughs, but told in a way that is developmentally appropriate because we're really not opposed to doing any topic. But if, you know, if we're going to talk about nuclear fusion or something like that, it has to be broken down, obviously, into uh, something and different entry points that kids will understand. We also love to see if there's a seasonal link, uh, the seasons, you know, if it comes in at, on time when we're planning a winter issue and there's some sort of winter link, that's great. We also look for curriculum links in the Canadian curriculum, even though each province is slightly different, but there are overarching themes there. We're also looking, as I mentioned, personal perspectives from children and also from adults, uh, own voices, stories. We're always looking for those uh, people who can tell a story from a perspective that maybe is underrepresented or has been um, underrepresented in the past. Um, so that is about that. Oh, and one more thing is, of course, develop those important developmental milestones that are kind of universal for for children, always looking for stories that resonate there. And that is me <laughs> and Chirp, Chickadee and Owl. Great. Thank you so much, Jackie. I think that, you know, the magazine has definitely got a much further reach than many of us realized. And you probably have a big team behind you. So I'm very curious to hear from the others and just compare awesome. how, how their development happens on a different scale. So next we have... Tilani. She is a writer, designer, publisher, actor, songwriter, educator, and passionate about creativity. Having taught in the public school system with a BA in theater arts and health education, Tilani created Bazoof magazine with an educational focus on health, career, sorry, character development, stream learning, and a place to showcase kids' creativity. The award-winning winning title has been operating as an international magazine since 2007 in both print and digital format. Yeah, thank everyone who's here, first of all. And I'm sure you're coming from a wide range of interests. But even though, you know, this medium may be magazines, you probably have an interest just in children's writing, um, children's media, publishing, and just educating kids in a fun and creative way. So we welcome all of you. It's really wonderful to all the different ways that you can uh, connect with children. So basically, I've got some pages from the magazine. I'm just going to go through them, It'll and I can just talk through them. It'll explain a lot of things. And so I'm just going to switch chairs here. So the magazine actually started as the name Zamoof. That was my original title. But as I progressed over time, we live in an alphabetical world, I always say. And I just found we were at the end of lists over and over again. So I made the very brave change and I, I try to keep the name as similar as possible. So uh, <coughs> it was Zamoof and that, then it became Bazoof, which bumped us up to the, at least the second letter in the alphabet. So that's kind of what happened there. And over time, it just was literally just the name of a magazine. It became actually the name of a city in space. 
my background, of, like it was mentioned, is in theater. So you can go to the next one. And you can even go to the next one. I'll pause right here for a bit. So basically, I like like the girls here, I've just got some amazing talent behind me that really show off the pages very, very well. So what, what kind of gradually morphed into is that the name of the magazine became the name of the city in space. So it actually is the pattern to the flow of the magazine year to year because we the children, the readers, are visiting the four different, well, there's five or six different neighborhoods each issue and we follow the seasons. So if it's springtime for us, it's springtime in the magazine. So it's really fun to see the city, you know, all decked in snow to the fall and, and whatnot. So this particular one I'm looking at looks like a summer issue. So it actually, we don't have like specific themes for each one. Our theme is what are we doing in the neighborhood right now? What's going on? And because it's a city and just how it is in regular communities, you've got restaurants, you've got, you know, um, gymnasiums, you have museums, you have, have theaters, you have pet stores. And, and so literally the content comes from turning the pages of the magazine. It's like entering in some of these buildings as you go through. Now, I come from a theater background, so I really, this is all just came from my crazy little mind, but it's, it's been a lot of fun. It's actually been really a lot of fun and a very positive thing for the readers as well. So we do special, you can click forward. Yeah, I'll just, on the far right, it was mentioned that we, you know, we, we are very much powered by children's submissions. And it's from two, since 2007 we, when we started, literally, we've just had a steady little flow of content coming to us from youth. We do work with children's, like classrooms with students and teachers. I would love to do more of that. So we'll try to get into that a little bit further. But otherwise we just, you know, we have an inbox, we have a page on our website and we just get this wonderful little flow always coming in. And we just, anything that's suitable, we basically pretty well have a promise that we will publish it somehow. Whether it goes in the magazine, we can just do all sorts of magic to make it fit. Or we have a blog and we've also got a new platform I'll just explain real quick. So that, I'm trying to focus on how our magazine is put together. So definitely uh, driven by where we're visiting in the city, what sort of um, features, we try to do a balance of different things from, from talking about, you know, how the body works to like, we'll have a health center to um, nutrition to, you know, fitness. We'll talk about a, a specific sport and just kind of balance throughout the year because we are quarterly. So you can flip ahead. So this particular magazine, you saw, you saw the two boys in the previous page. This comic I was introduced when I first started the magazine, and literally it's a couple boys who are in grade five. And the comic was just, it's silly humor. I've had adults say like, I just don't find it funny. Well, I just say, you just gotta be a kid. It's just, you know, the way kids think. So I, we've, we, we've kind of, you know, rejigged it, I guess you could say. And I use about three different sources to, to put the comic together now. Their original one, a previous version that we did years ago, and now it's much more of a polished version. So anyways, Ninja Bob, it's just been really fun for the kids. But it came from the minds of two grade five-year-olds. Um, grade five, sorry. Go ahead. We, uh, as far as we do lots of fiction and nonfiction, True stories, I, it definitely was a passion of mine even before I started the magazine. So this one, it used to be called Lessons Learned When We Were You. It, it has transitioned into true little stories because we started to get stories coming from children themselves. And it was originally parents, adults, writing about stories, things that happened, events in their life that made an impact or 
you know, help them see things in a different way. And now we've just had such a, a nice little interest from youth coming in that we, we switched it so anyone can write these. And this is open to writers all the time. This is, um, again, we kind of feature different things in the city, but this, is, this one was, is just a fresh editorial. So this is just literally about a young woman who has a passion for animals. We just called it Mejo Zoo. We did a video on this one as well. And it, it just turned out, I think, really well. You can go on. We have a podcast that we do as well. So we did a podcast. I'm trying to think if this is the one. No, we saved the elephant one for this current issue. You can go. Yeah, so again, we do touch on science. We do, we are um, stream. Stream is, you know, the, we include the reading and the art in what we do, which really goes along with the, the very strong creative focus that we have. Just touching this real quick, we, of course, we, you just get so much content, you're just wondering what to do with it. So this has been a great new little platform that we started last spring. It's the, the readers can enjoy between our print issues, and it's called Planet Glack, which is where the city of is on. And it's just literally, um, I, I, it's like a really fancy blog, I guess you could say. But again, just more reading if, if the, our readers are looking for between more between issues of the magazine. And most, this it didn't start this way, but all our stories now, these particular stories are coming from children. And we just love that. So this one actually came from a classroom. So... Those I don't pretty much don't have openings for, but we do have openings for some of the other stories that I can explain a little bit more. Here's, here's one. We're always looking for submissions. It happened to me. This is basically an ex expanded version of true little story. So it just takes one story and it goes into it in a bit more depth. And these have come from youth, adults. I mean, we've I think we've done one in every issue and it's been, you know, what, 16 years so we've had a lot of really uh, and, and the magazine is known for it it's really kind of a trademark too is our true stories so we're always open to uh, writers sending us submissions for this yeah and this is just you know kind of a little scrapbook here at the end where we put a lot of we get a lot of poetry more than what we can publish as long as it's not too long it's you know coming from a child 12 years and younger and, the, and it's not too dark or spooky and amazing what some kids write about. But uh, we, the, we get a lot of really fun. I, I'm, some of it, I'm not even sure. I don't even know how an adult could write it. It is so cleverly done. Kids do amazing stuff. And I think that's it for this feature. Yeah. So my time's up. Great. Thanks to Lenny. It's just great to know that there are places for kids to express themselves and we'll dive a bit deeper into that. Um, but first we'll hear from Rebecca. So our next guest is Rebecca Clapperton Law. She's enjoyed a long career of leadership roles in the not-for-profit sector and more recently with Nature Kids BC team for three years as the executive director. She's witnessing the growth of the public's awareness of how nature benefits our whole person, particularly kids, and also our shared responsibility to care for that nature for the long term. She's a mother of three amazing young humans here in Vancouver and an active appreciative member of the Vancouver Public Library System, which is always excellent. <laughs> Thanks very much. I think uh, uh, we're really honored to receive the invitation to join in Word Vancouver's uh, festival uh, and to be a part of this dialogue in particular. Nature Wild as a magazine is a, a little known contributor in the space of, of children's magazines, although we're 22 years old as an organization. Um, we are also uh, a provincial entity here in BC and uh, very honored to be on the lands, um, learning and growing and playing on the lands of First Nations right across the province, north, northeast, south and west. Um, so Nature Kids BC as an organization is a grassroots network of clubs across the province. And it's a way for children that are age five through 12 
and the grown-ups who love them to be exposed to nature uh, in learning, playing, exploring, and taking action for nature. So uh, established uh, with a, a mission to enable every child in BC to to have these experiences. And since day one, Nature Wild as a kids magazine. So admittedly, I don't have any, any presentation visually, but I have brought a number of issues to share and circulate. Um, so from day one as an organization, Nature Wild was a component part of membership in the Nature Kids community. So we produce four times a year seasonally, and I'll speak to our format in a little bit. It's a well-loved component of membership. There are 30 different community clubs across the province, all run by volunteers. Again, I mentioned that it's a grassroots organization. So the magazine is a way for, for children and the grown-ups in their lives uh, to really slow down and, similar to being in nature, be present, right? I think that's what all of our... Um, magazines enable folks to do. It's tactile, it's, it's paper, you've got to sit, you've got to be with it. And, um, you know, again, in, in that way, we find there's some real harmony between Nature Wild magazine and the mission of Nature Kids BC. Um, our magazine is, I mentioned that we work with, um, or the invitation to connect with children that are aged five through 12, which is kindergarten through grade seven, primary and middle school, right? So the magazine itself is um, you know, targeting an audience right in the middle, around a grade four audience. But you'll see some content that'll appeal to the littles in the primary, and you'll see some content that will invite you know, some more advanced thinking and workings on uh, nature and nature-based topics. You know, originally our organization was called the Young Naturalist Clubs of BC, right? And so that's our heritage, is the naturalist community. And the magazine's byline, I can see, was the magazine for young naturalists in British Columbia. That made a lot of sense. Nature Kids BC was a rebrand and a, a way of uh, evolving as an organization in 2015. And on our cover, the byline is now for kids who love nature. And so, you know, for me as a, a team member, this is something that I can really get behind. You know, we've got the word love on the cover of every single one of our magazines, right? And in our constitution, in fact, we, we exist in the long term to enable the children to connect with nature in a way that they can enjoy it, that they can love and appreciate. They can wonder and be amazed at the complexity, at the diversity of BC's ecosystems and flora and fauna. That's why Nature Kids exist. And by extension, Nature Wild is stimulating, is, uh, is a component part of that, of that mission. Um, and uh, in fact, if you're not a member of a club, we do have a number of families join us um, that um, perhaps are in a more remote area. And they, uh, you know, in, in our community are called free range families, right? And the free range families particularly attached to the magazine as a member inside the community and a sense of belonging to some greater community and appreciation for British Columbia's nature. So with respect to format, uh, I mentioned that it started in 2000. Um, right when the organization got started. This was really important to the founder, right? And the founder was with us for the first 20 years and we're only in 22 years as an organization, right? She was quite an incredible naturalist here in the British Columbian community, um, had led the larger organization called BC Nature as a volunteer chair, et cetera. And so her network really is how we found contributors over the years through our, our magazine to contribute their expertise, their scientific knowledge, right? So here we've got an aquatic theme and here uh, I'm recirculating this fall from 2016 to many of our clubs because the feature is mushrooms in the forest, right? The other thing about working with nature-based and naturalist information, science-based information is that it can, it can stay relevant, you know, for educators and for families um, and for libraries um, with a shelf life for five years. Right? It's, not, um, it's not a time-bound type of uh, topic. So we're, 
we're excited to reshare all of the content that has been so well developed quality-wise through the process. So uh, in terms of the process, um, you'll find inside the magazine uh, the science-based articles, the nature-based articles, the art-based articles. We want to look at nature from a number of different perspectives. We'll find species identification, which can often also on the back page be um, a way of encouraging kids to build a BC nature scrapbook. So depending, sometimes it's birds and sometimes it's um, exciting um, visual. Some, this one, of course, is the mushrooms. Word puzzles, nature champions, and youth stories, right? So again, I think what we heard from the two other panelists was the importance of the readers seeing themselves inside the magazine that they're reading. And so we love to feature nature champions in the form of the young primary students taking action and the young um, middle school students taking action. Those stories are so inspiring for us and for for um, the readers. And then club news. So again, um, as a provincial entity, one thing that we particularly look at is not only the diversity of flora and fauna in the province, in terms of features and information sharing and storytelling, but we're also looking at the geographic diversity, right? Um, and that geographic diversity leads to, you know, the, the province with the greatest number of, of different ecosystems. It's a fascinating place for us to be living in and learning about. Uh, so we do um, take a look at how the north is represented, how the island is represented, how Vancouver Island is represented, how, uh, how the Kootenays, for example, and the interior. Um, I'm particularly pleased that we did do a full northern feature last, uh, last winter and uh, looked at the science of the caribou, who, you know, are a critical species and a species at risk. And we talked all about the science there and the partnerships with the Indigenous communities that were contributing to the survival of this wonderful species across Canada. Um, Salmon Wild would be another feature that I would call out as one of our points of pride. It's been done three times and each time um, advanced the science and advanced the perspectives that we invited into the magazine. So of course the magazine started at eight pages uh, and it's now 16 pages. Salmon Wild as a product um, only being made, you know, every two or three years as a keystone species here in BC uh, is a, a, a 24 page um, special edition. So the, the contributors then, I mentioned our origins in the naturalist community, the contributors have primarily been our BC's naturalists, the experts, you know, the, the park naturalists, the interpreters, uh, the folks, the environmental educators, uh, the ecology centers, and uh, increasingly and organizationally as a, as a leadership team, as a community, we're recognizing the breadth of perspectives beyond the Western science that we can access and in fact are, you know, hold a responsibility as an educator for young people and, and for the public. So um, we have been uh, inviting uh, storytelling, uh, representing different ways of knowing and being inside um, the magazine. And we look to, you know, support that with structures into the future in the form of advisors um, and, uh, you know, established models of, of leadership or governance to ensure that um, we are reflecting that uh, diverse perspective in the nature and how um, we experience nature in such a diverse diverse ways. Our photos, um, illustrations, all coming again from nature enthusiasts, they're all accurate to the species. So the photos, of course, would be found here in British Columbia. And the um, illustrations, uh, I've uh, been uh, involved in a number of editorial conversations coming back to the, the comic uh, illustrator, for example, to suggest that this bird wouldn't be found in this tree in this season, for example. So we do try as best we can to really reflect the actual experience here in British Columbia. And the stories, we go to the source, right? So who has the expertise with the coyotes and who has the expertise with the caribou or the fungus or the isopods and the native plants? And this um, oftentimes can mean academe. And this can be a bit of a break for academe too. They can really enjoy not having to look at who's listed as the lead author on an article, but rather have to really get inside the mind of someone who's maybe three foot two, you know, as, as they're... Um, their audience. And so that's really the back and forth that the editorial team has with the experts. It's a wonderful creative challenge for 
for the uh, na nature enthusiasts to then think about the children as an audience and to uh, to share. And then, of course, con contributions are also um, embedded in through the partnerships that the organization builds over time. The ecology centers, Lynn Canyon being one just across the waters, uh, Scout Island being another up in Williams Lake. Um, Stanley Park Ecology Society, you know, occasionally weaving in content, and the Invasive Species Council of British Columbia. So there's there's provincial entities and regional entities, and we really um, have such a privileged position to be able to offer voice to all of the collaborators that are interested in eco literacy of our youth here in British Columbia, and then building the leadership of stewards across the province as well. So. That's really a little bit about uh, how we do what we do. They're all volunteer contributors and a volunteer editorial team, which kind of blows my mind, you know, thinking about how that happens in 22 years. Um, and it's four times a year. Uh, and we have a very talented graphic designer um, who is our only paid employee on the, and, and a wonderful publishing relationship with the printer of R. R. Donnelly. So there's some, um, lots of teamwork that goes behind the scenes thank you so much to all three of you it is so interesting to hear about the process and just to see all the thought that goes into each of these publications and you know you you mentioned rebecca about the tactile appeal of a magazine and i think that you know many of us had grown up with either like a chickadee or a chirp in our own hands or the hands of our children and all have that memory of just what is so appealing about a magazine um, but there is also this strong educational component in all three of these publications. So how do you sort of balance that fun and pleasure with also the education? Because we know that for children to be engaged with literature, it almost has to not feel like they're being taught. Um, so, so yes, how do, you, how do you all sort of manage that as you're producing the magazine? Jackie, are you? Oh, sure. Sorry. Am I feeling? <laughs> Sorry. Um, I assume it's probably the same process for all of us, but I think it's important to have different entry points for information always with, with kids. So we do in the magazines, and I saw some of these in your spreads too, um, sidebars, captions on photos. There's always a fun way to relay information. So we rely heavily on not just long paragraphs of text, but lots of other fun ways. And we do quizzes and stuff like that too, where you can learn a lot in a quiz, but it's still super fun and engaging for kids. So yeah, I like how you said you can get some education in there without them putting on the brakes and realizing like, oh wait, hold on, I'm being, I'm being educated right now they just think they're having a great time and they're thirsty for information so <laughs> yeah i think i think you've nailed that right there they are thirsty for information but it is nice when they don't feel like it's being preached to them so um in terms of all the young contributors that both jackie you and teleni have in your magazines um what kind of feedback do you get from them when they see their their work in the in in the magazine I'm sure that they probably get excited and you might get some letters or contact from them after they see their work there. Yeah, I'll respond to that. So I always feel like I get the short end of the stick because I would love to be in the room when some of the kids get, you know, anytime they get published and, and their parents see what they've contributed. And so I don't get to see those moments. And I we do get our, our occasional thank yous and excitement coming to us via email. But the majority is just behind the scenes and we don't get to see it. So that's kind of a little bit of a sad part. But but uh, we see enough to know that it's it's happening all the time. And it's really what powers us in, in what we do. We love all that positive energy that we're sharing and and just the idea is to help children grow in a positive and to see what they're capable of to help them see that to empower them 
and to build their confidence because, you know, they are our future and they are extremely capable. So that's really what's behind our publishing their work. Did you have anything to add, Jackie? I think Talini said it perfectly. That's, that's why we do what we do. <laughs> I think definitely you see the labor of love behind all of these magazines. Certainly when hearing that all your contributors are volunteers, you know, it's amazing that we have such high level scientists and ecologists that are, you know, this is meaningful work for them. And um, that's, that's just really inspiring to hear. So um, now I was, it's, it's also wonderful to hear how, you know, different voices are starting to be featured in all these different publications. And I know that's probably one change that has occurred in the landscape of magazines over time. Have you seen any other real distinct noticeable changes or do you foresee any other pivots coming up in the world of magazines? Yeah, I mean, especially Jackie, you've got your YouTube channel, you've got your app, so you really are reaching um, quite far. Um, how have all those things evolved and are there any things in store? You know, it's so hard to predict. I mean, if you had asked me or any of us 15 years ago, we thought, oh, people aren't going to read print anymore. We have to create all these different things. And print is still going really strong. So it's really hard to predict. And for us, we're always a work in progress. Um, we started a YouTube channel kind of just by accident and then it got some traction. So we've held on to that. Um, I was interested to hear that Talini has done a podcast. That's something that we've considered, but we've never really gotten it off the ground because none of us are podcast experts. So, but we always try these different things just based on changing expectations of the market as well as the culture. Um, but it's so hard to say what the future holds. It's so hard to predict. <laughs> anything to add yeah yeah i'll just say you have to learn to you know be flexible right and see where because obviously kids are driven in positive directions and negative directions so we want to be a part of driving them in positive directions and yes can they have too much screen time absolutely so print is our our number one anything is just literally just an offshoot from that to support it but we are number one trying to encourage kids to read read print and um, keep a good balance in their life too much content is not good as well so you know every child needs to have a balance in their life and and we just hope to to support the good and positive things that parents and educators are, are offering Thank you. Now, when you speak about balance, I'm quite interested in the fact that a couple of your magazines have an international presence, and then one of them is very localized and specific to BC. So can you speak of the advantages or challenges of targeting a niche community versus trying to create a publication that captures a broader audience with appeal around the globe? So we start with BC. Um, well, I used the word, uh, you know, privilege um, really intentionally a little earlier because of all that we have access to here in, in British Columbia to profile and to learn about. So uh, it is abundant. We really feel a sense of abundance related to the themes and the potential for the magazine. Our um, audience isn't limited to member families, for example, but the educator community is quite keen and we do connect um, when resources are available. We have built out curriculum connections to enable, you know, the print to come off the paper for the activities to be happening in the classroom to make it easier for educators to bring it to life. And not only that, but families and community centers. So right now the reach then becomes um, related to uh, community agency relationships. And so, for example, this summer, summer camps um, in Kamloops included salmon wild and salmon habitat in some of their nature-based programming. 
and they used our magazine as a platform for the program. Um, and the kids had had an experience in the camp. And at the back, we've got a stream assessment, which helps you learn about your place and space. And so the Kamloops kids were doing this in camp. And some of them got quite excited about it. And they took the water monitoring kits home and asked the parents, this is what I'm learning from the program leads, that they asked the parents to come and go and check this out and let's visit this lake. And so they introduced you know, their parents to these ecosystems as well, because they had such fun doing it the first time round it, it, with their peers and this group happened to be you know the Kamloops Immigrant Settlement uh, Association working with newcomer families right so the more that we can there's just so much potential here in the British Columbia marketplace for us within the K through 7 system it's a little known organization a little known publication and we would just love for more schools more libraries more community centers to have access to it so um you know, that's, you know, our niche still has tons of potential. <laughs> Sorry, we, we can't see Jackie, so we're just wondering, <laughs> does Jackie have something to say? Or <laughs> oh, I think it's fascinating to have a niche market because definitely owl, chickadee, and chirp are, are not niche at all. So general interest can sometimes be a challenge um, because we don't always know our audience and um and because of where we are geographically too we tend to sort of build a community in our own neighborhood and so sometimes it can be challenging to tell stories from different perspectives because you know we're there's no way that we can represent every reader unfortunately but we do try our best but it's, it's hard to keep in mind. We have readers in Australia and their seasons are opposite to us. So I always think about that when we're planning a winter issue and the kids in Australia, it just must not make any sense to them at all. But, <laughs> but we try our best. Okay. Now, how do you manage all the submissions coming in? I'm sure, what are the numbers like that we're looking at? And do you have a team specifically for that? And also as you know, we try to teach children about the editing process, this is a really motivating way for them to get writing. Is there an editing process once those submissions come in with the children that are contributing? Yeah, just a little bit about submissions because we do receive quite a few. I noticed our number uh, went down, like you'd almost think that it would go up during COVID, but ours actually went down because the classroom structure got disrupted, right? Like many classrooms went online. And so a lot of teachers that would have their students, um, a part of their assignment was that they had to send it to various to try to get it published. And so there's lists out there on various websites. So I noticed our numbers did go down during COVID because of that disruption. And they're kind of gradually coming back a bit, which is all good because was we were getting too many before. So it's actually been a little bit more manageable. But we just always, um, like I mentioned, just try to, I mean, we don't have too many that we can't put them somewhere. And as long as it kind of fits our little criteria, which is on our website, then then um, at this point, we've been okay. We would love to get more Canadian submissions. We're just a little bit over half of our readers are coming from the US and a little bit less than that are Canadian and then international. So we, the majority of our submissions are coming from uh, in the United States. So we're definitely looking for more Canadian involvement, which would be wonderful. That's great to know. I wasn't, I didn't know that your readers were in the US. So yeah, we would love more Canadian content as well. Jackie, did you have anything to respond to? Uh, we also get a lot of submissions from readers and we do personally respond to each and every one, whether it's email or we still get a lot of letters. But unfortunately, we don't have as many pages as we would like to to dedicate to reader submissions. Um, but we have, you know, one or two pages in every issue. But the hardest part of of our job, I think, is choosing which kids to include in in the issue. 
it's so difficult. <laughs> I wish we could publish them all. Okay, we are nearing the end of our event. Um, I, I think we have time for one qu more question. Does anyone in the audience have anything that they were curious about or wa wanted to ask before we end off? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I'm going to repeat the question. The question was in terms of funding, how, how do you get the funding for these publications? vastly different than you can imagine, yeah. Mm -hmm. As a not-for-profit organization, um, we are funded through a variety of sources, including grants and the British Columbian government and individual donors and some partnership relationships. Um, Nature Wild is a component part of running the organization. And yet we also have um, an individual donor that's really passionate about the publication and has been since inception. So the donation for the magazine has grown to enable us to uh, produce uh, and distribute the um, magazine to this point. Um, so it, it's kind of an underwriting donation. The subscriptions also support, but there's such a fraction of what it actually, uh, so the subscription is less than 5% of the actual production costs, right? Um, so we're, we're really grateful to the uh, family that's incredibly committed year over year to make sure that this gets out to children and families across the province. Yeah, Bazoof is, has been it, it's it's a private company but it it's i mean it it runs close to a nonprofit i must admit uh all children's magazines like most people know are not are fueled by advertising so it's very discouraged by some parents don't like to see it and others as long as there's not too much it's manageable so you do have to, it's a very, very tricky balance of managing your costs, your expenses. Um, I, so I cannot have any volunteers except for, you know, sometimes we have high schools that are getting work experience. Other than that, everybody's paid. And I, you know, we pay very fair and, and uh, it's, and rely on the talent that we, we get to, to publish the magazine. So you got to keep that quality up. But yeah, grants and um, just a lot of hard work and, and dedication to what, what it is that you do, but uh, we've managed to keep it going for sure. And finally, Jackie. I loved both those answers. And actually we are kind of similar. And I think that all, like you said, all children's magazines are almost a not-for-profit. We also rely on grants and we are part of a big, bigger publishing company, um, but that's not where the bulk of our finances come from. And we also are a subscription model, but that's not <laughs> where, where we get a lot of money. It's, it's mostly grants, we're beholden to grants and same with the other magazines. We do one page of advertising per issue but that's as much as we do. And sometimes not even one page. We try to keep it really minimal based on reader feedback. So yeah, Government of Canada grants. Well, thank you all for your tenacity in the industry and just sharing all your experiences and most certainly above all the passion for kids at the center of all three of your publications. I, I hope everyone takes a look at the magazines here as well as online and you can of course subscribe on each of their individual websites if you are interested in their publications. Um, once again, if you would like to purchase any of the books at the festival, please visit our official bookseller from Iron Dog Books. And thank you to all the staff and volunteers at Word Vancouver for making this possible. Although we're nearing the end of the festival, there are still more events happening later this evening. So please check out the complete listing at wordvancouver.ca um, or keep the site bookmarked for future festival details. But thank you again so much for joining us today, everybody here, everybody online, and of course our guests, editors, and executive director. Thank you so much.